Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us for Daily Plus with Dr. Angela. I am your host, Dr. Angela Tester. You know what I like to do on my show. I want to enlighten, inspire, and empower you to become your best self. Now, Scripture reminds us that the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And today, we want to get you fired up about a children's book. My guest today is Lawrence Quammen, and he's written the book, Evergreen. I think you are definitely going to enjoy it. So let me tell you a little bit about Lawrence. He has spent 23 years in practice as a physician's assistant and later joined his wife, um, Rebecca, in the medical information systems consulting firm that she founded. His interest in writing came from a desire to create a fictional work dedicated to his three granddaughters in honor of his father. Now, Lawrence also spends time weekly as a mentor in a faith-based nonprofit organization known as Team Up. Mentoring. Team Up was founded in 2006 and takes care of abused and neglected children ranging in the age from 4 to 19. The children serve on selected the children served are selected using the ACE, or the Adverse Childhood Experiences Scoring System, created in a joint effort between the CDC and Kaiser Foundation. The scoring model ranks abuse on a 10-point scale. Lawrence is in his fourth year as a mentor for fourth and fifth grade boys and just completed a two-year term as chairman of the board of directors for Team Up. He also spent three years working with a faith-based nonprofit group named the Good News Club. The group provides biblical teachings and activities for elementary school children in school-based aftercare programs. Lawrence and Rebecca live in Monroe, Georgia, and as well as have also lived in Florida. Now, you know what I'm about to say. Go on, get comfy, get cozy, because we are about to get started. Good morning, Lauren. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Well, thank you, Doctor. I'm proud to be here and, and be part of your, your program. I love what you are doing with the mentoring programs and the organizations that you are a part of. Now, I, I want to definitely talk about your book, but I, I want to ask you about that. Was there a particular point in your life that you knew, hey, I need to be a mentor, or I really need to get involved with some organizations that are doing some really great stuff. How did you know you wanted to walk along that path? Well, actually, actually, Dr. Chester, it was really pretty close to the end of my professional career as I began to have a little bit of time on my hands, and I, and I have uh, I've really been blessed in my career, and I thought it was about time for me for me to give something back for all that. So. I've always been fascinated with kids and my grandchildren and my children, so I decided that mentoring would be a good idea about the time I retired and had some free time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, it's so interesting that you say that because um, I have found that it's certain people with a certain type of heart. We're not knocking anyone else, but you do come to that realization that now is the time that I need to get involved, regardless of what you've done as a career, but now is the time that I step out. So thank you so much from do, for doing that. I'm sure the children love the fact that you are there to assist them. That is awesome. Now, as yeah. well, an author is concerned. Is that something that you knew that you always wanted to do? And if so, at what age did it dawn on you that words are powerful? You know, um, I've always, I've really, it's odd, I've never really thought about writing a book. I've, I've done a lot of things that I wanted to do in life, but I hadn't really, I'm a voracious reader and I love to read. But um, it, about the time that I was thinking about writing the book, I thought that it would be helpful uh, if I could use this book as a means to 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 do something of benefit for the for the kids that I take care of, or for other ministries that that need funding. Uh huh. Uh huh. I can under I can understand that. Now, as far as writing, we have you know adult books. We have books for, and I mean simply books for adults. We have uh, books that are for teenagers, for, you know, little, little kids, like little baby books, the little board books. What made you decide that, 
a children's book for this topic was best as opposed to perhaps writing it for young adults? Um, actually, actually, when I wrote the book and I was meeting with the publisher and they asked me what, what range of, of ages that I wrote for, and I, I, and I said, well, I write for everybody. And the person said, well, if you write for everybody, then you're going to be writing for nobody because the bookstores don't know where to put your book. <laughs> and so, right. and so <laughs> And so I had to, so I had to make a choice, and it was hard. So I, I chose chose the age range from nine to thirteen. Not, you know, not that I don't think the children. This book would be nice to read to your child if the child were smaller, but it's certainly a right. book that's geared towards towards the nine to thirteen range. Mhm, mhm. And you know, I think that's really that's such a great age range there because, like you said, you can have that older sibling or perhaps the babysitter can read it to a younger child and they will be interested in the book as well. So I think that's, that's really, really smart. Now, um, how did you decide to write about three mice as your principal characters? Why mice? Well, my, my father was in sales and had a multi-state territory, and he, as a result, he traveled weekly, leaving on Monday morning and coming home on Friday. During his nights in motels across the South, he would write stories for his children based on the annex of three mice, Pooksy, Mooksy, and Chrissy. As I was fairly young at the time, I don't remember much detail about the stories. However, I clearly remember the characters and the joy of hearing a new story every Friday evening. So I used the three sisters as the principal characters in my books. However, I had to create entirely new adventures, and I added new characters along the way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, as you add characters, how do the characters come to you? Um, is it just a personality that comes to you first, and you try to fit a particular animal that you think would highlight the, the character? What's your process there? Well, so, so it's just sort of a mix. It's sort of a mixed bag. For instance, in this book, I have two human characters. Uh, one is the owner of the of the Hill and Dale Sawmill and Lumber Company, and the other is a gentleman named Joe Phillips who runs the sawmill. And then there are the girls' parents, Mom and Papa Hopkins, and the Gray family, who are friends of the of the mice family. And then there was the three crows, the Crow brothers, Archie Festus and Sam, and then Sweet Pea, the mill cat and Phineas G. Hopper, a juvenile grasshopper, and finally two rats named the, Riz- the Rizzo brothers, uh, Rico and Carlos, and an old mule named Clyde. So I choose my characters to fill specific spots and needs in the story as the storyline develops. It's the best way I can describe it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love it. A mule named Clyde. I, I think that is just adorable. And it's, it's so interesting how in children's books you find that there are certain characters who tend to resonate with the children for just whatever reason, and they find um, the characters to be adoring in, in their own way. I, I love yeah. that. So when you were writing, did you find that, uh, the title of the book came to you first, and you kind of wrote around that. Or did the title of the book come out of your writings? What was your process for titling the book? Well, it really was sort of a practical thing, Dr. Chester. Um, I had I really needed I, I needed to create a fictional town uh, to for all these things to take place in and around. So Evergreen is really the name of a fictional small rural town, which, as I say, is just south of North Georgia and a little bit west of East Georgia. Uh, the, the reader will find the deep woods situated across the old orchard highway at the north end of town, and uh, the Hillendale Saw, Sawmill and Lumber Company is located by a mile west of town, nestled in the woods on the right side of the highway, and all the adventures take place in and around those locations. So, it, so Evergreen just appealed to me as a name. Maybe it was thinking about woods and forests, but uh, it was really a basically more practical need of just naming naming a fictional town. Mm-hmm. I love that. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking as you were describing that, being someone that's natively from Virginia, it is so beautiful when we kind of step, a, step away from the hustle and the bustle of our larger cities um, and get into a space where there is nature and things kind of quiet down a bit and our imaginations can kind of take over there. Um, I remember yeah. going camping as a kid and just enjoying <laughs> Spending time in nature, so I can I can definitely yeah. understand where where you were going with with that one. Now, yeah. how, 
how would you describe your book um, in comparison to, if I understand correctly, this is a series that you have? Yes, it's a trilogy. There are three books. The, um, uh, Evergreen is the first of the three. Um, the, as, I, as I mentioned before, I've, I'm a pretty voracious reader, so even as a youngster, I was exposed to things uh, uh, like Watership Down and Jungle Book, and those were sort of the books that, 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 that my, my book was written in the spirit of books like that, like Watership Down and Jungle Book. Um, mm-hmm. And this book follows, yep, this, this book follows the three mice from their birth until their early teenage years. Uh, Evergreen is about the magical childhood, family and trust and love and friendship. And the stories are filled with adventure and camaraderie. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love it. Well, Lawrence, it is almost time for us to go to break. But before we do, I want to give you an opportunity, if you would, please. Can you remind everyone what is the title of your book? Where can we pick up a copy? And how do we follow you online? All right. Um, the book is called Evergreen. Uh, and, and the name of the trilogy, once all three books are done, is called The, the Adventures of Pooksy, Mooksy, and Chrissy. Um, you, the books are available uh, on, on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble, and, uh, and, and soon will be available uh, on my website. Probably That's about a month away. But if you want to follow me right now, uh, you can follow me at my website, which is pmcadventures.com. That's pmcadventures.com. I love it. Alrighty, listeners, now you know where you can pick up a copy of the book. We'll be back right after this. Being with Infants by Montessori teacher trainer and world-renowned child specialist Beverly Kovach is finally on DVD and digital download. The long-awaited 3D disc set is essential for any new parent, grandparent, or infant caregiver wanting respectful relationships with infants and their care. Being with Infants is broken down into 20 easy-to-digest video lessons, complete with demonstrations. Everything from diapering, feeding, the proper way of picking up infants, sleep, crying, environment, play, weaning, and much more are covered. Being with Infants is available on DVD and digital download at Walmart, Target, Barnes & Noble, and Amazon. Order today and be sure to follow Being With Infants on Facebook for free bonus content. And we are back. Thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spot with Dr. Angela. I am talking with Lawrence. Quaman today, and I'm so excited. He's written a book called Evergreen, and it's for our little folks. Well, maybe not too little, nine to about 13. So a kid's book is always something that I love to talk about because it makes me smile, making sure that our little ones know that we want to spend time with them. It's a great way to bond. You guys already know my little story when it comes to me and my mom and spending time reading books together. So I think that that's something that uh, is near and dear to my heart. So I love having children book authors on. So uh, let's go on and finish talking with Lawrence. So Lawrence, I have to ask you, um, uh, do any of your characters have problems or issues or things that they want to talk about? And do your stories bring about the change in how you address the issue or the concern that they have? Uh, yes, I'm, and I'm glad you asked. There's a, there, here, there's a little bit of context I need to give first. So Pooksy is the oldest of the sisters, and she's calm and confident and a natural leader. Chrissy is the youngest, and she's happy and fearless and full of energy. But the middle sister, Mooksy, tends to be a little bit of a worrier. Uh, so so, so mm-hmm. in, in the latter part of the book, towards the end of a fun-filled day with her sisters, Mooksy comes to a decision. And I'm quoting, the, t- the way to have fun and, and, and happiness without fear or worry is to have good plans, to think about what you want to do and then plan for the things that might come up. Being prepared means that you have plans for the things you expect and the things that you don't. Good plans give you confidence, and it becomes silly to worry. From this point on, 
now I'm not no longer quoting, but for, for this from this point on, uh, Muxi begins to emerge as the planner for the trio, and this becomes much more evident in the second book. The second character, I have two characters, so if there's still enough time, the second character that has an issue is, is Sweet Pea, the mill cat. He's a retired middle-aged cat that's a little heavy and out of shape for the job of keeping the mill property free of pests. <laughs> and to make, to make matters worse, he's, clum he's clumsy and seems to have four left paws, as the saying goes. And often as a result, he trips at high speeds when chasing pests. And this results in falling forward and bouncing at least once on his big tummy and smacking his fuzzy chin on the ground, which makes his teeth ache and his ears ring. But what hurts more than the smacking his chin is the pain of embarrassment. Well, Joe Phillips is watching one afternoon when the, during an ill-fated attempt uh, uh, when, when, uh, when, when uh, Sweet Pea was in, a, in, in the midst of an ill-fated attempt to, for, for a partial uh, revenge against the Hopkins family. Um, he sustained a sprain to his right rear ankle and a partial dislocation of the tip of his tail. So Joe is searching for the cat later that cold evening and finds him on a pile of logs, breathing hard and looking really uncomfortable. He takes the cat to his home and over a period of several days nurses him back to health. When the time is just right, Joe puts Sweet Pea through a, a feeding and exercise program that transports the, transforms the cat from flop over to tough nut. In the end, Sweet Pea is lean, muscular, and confident with the respect of all the mill staff and all the local critters and pests. I love <laughs> It. I love it. And I like how you've given them such a personality. And I think that most people can find maybe a bit of themselves in a particular personality or at least someone they know. You know, I can just imagine that the kids are, are kind of giggling along as, as they go on this adventure with the characters through the book. I, I love it. Now, did you choose to illustrate the book as well? Yes, um, there are there are several illustrations actually. I was um, I was really blessed to find a gentleman named Mark Norakis. He's a skilled artist and illustrator. And uh, Mark, uh, when Mark works with me, I give him character profiles for each character, and then he uses his profiles to to create uh, illustrations that that will show me what he thinks I'm thinking of, you know, mentally. And so he did an exquisite job. He did uh, illustrations for all. 20 of the characters, and then um, he also did uh, exquisite maps of, of, the, of the town of Evergreen, of the, of the Sawmill and Lumber Company grounds, and also of the deep woods. So um, illustrations are important to me because they nudge the child's imagination towards the image that the author has in mind, which I think helps them rather than giving them a book that's just all page fulls, pages of sentences with no illustrations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, you, you kind of nailed it there. I, I love the illustrations in children's books. If you're right, it really does help the child kind of um, expand their imagination and, and go on the ride with you. I, I love that. So on your yep. title page of your book, underneath the title, there's, um, if, I, if I understand correctly, a picture of an open book with stars that seem to be floating up out of it with the words that mm -hmm. say, Real magic for young minds. I love yes. what I think that means, but can you explain it to me? Yes, um, um, yes, and this is another, and I forgot to mention this when I was talking about the illustrator's work, but that book with the stars and so forth uh, was, do was done by the illustrator for me, and, um, and that, 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 that illustration is not just unique to Evergreen. It will be found in each of the three books of the trilogy and really stands for more about what my what my feelings are about about the, the matter. So imagination is truly real magic, a strong, well-established reading program for children that contains fictional as well as other works is essential. Reading feeds and strengthens a child's imagination. There are studies out that reveal that children empowered with robust imaginations that come from, fictional, from reading fictional stories as well as other works tend to develop into young adults that are more creative, that enter the workforce with better problem solving and analytical skills and are more inclined to think out of the box. In the words of one of the world's greatest minds, and I quote, imagination is more important than knowledge. For while knowledge defines all that we know and understand, imagination points to all that we might yet discover and create. And those words are the words of Albert Einstein. 
Mm-hmm. I love that. I love that. Wow, that that is definitely a nugget. Listeners, I know you are heading to Twitter right now, and you're going to share that out. That was awesome. I love it. What a wonderful reminder. Now, as far as the, the other books that, you, that you're planning on writing, um, do you have a release date for them already? Are they, you know, close to being published? How, how soon can we get our hands on those as well? Uh, well, the, uh, I would say to you candid, candidly that it'll be mid to late summer of this year, um, of 2020. Um, the initial manuscript is complete. The character profiles are complete for the new characters that are come in this book that weren't part of the first one. Uh, I'm waiting now for completion of the illustrations and the cover design as well. And the last thing, of course, in the writing world, you have to have that line edit of the manuscript to make sure that your grammar and syntax is all correct and you hadn't, you hadn't committed any grammatical errors. So that's all that that's all that's, that's to be done. Right, right. I, I love it. Now, are you engaged in other activities that involve either the health or the welfare of children? Are you able to continue on with your your nonprofit work as well as well while you're being in office? Um, I, I will I will continue to do the mentoring uh, that, that you that you addressed so nicely uh, at the beginning of the of the interview. Um, and, and and I'm also one of the goals that I have. Um, I, I'm. A, as a, as, a, as a clinician and as a medical provider, I've been concerned for a long time about the children of, of single parents uh, because as single parents are trying to raise mm-hmm. one or more children, they, sometimes their medical needs tend to fall through the cracks, and, you know, and they don't necessarily get the routine things, you know, eye yes. exam and, and so that kind of stuff that the kids get. So I'm looking for a way to create a mobile sort of resource that you can go out into communities with a team of people and provide those those exams uh, for children close to home because those parents often don't have great transportation. So that's that's probably one of my favorite things that I hope to do between now and the next couple of years. That is amazing. Oh, my goodness. Oh, well, my prayer for you is, is that you will be able to come up with that. I think that is a great idea. And you are, you are so right. It, as you were talking, it made me think about, you know, that single dad that perhaps his wife has passed away or that single mom and, yes. you know, dad could be away at work in like a whole other country or, you know, in another yes. state or are they displaced for whatever reason due to death or incarceration. It's just yes. it's so true. Life happens yes. and so yes. many well, times you know, you know, suffer. Yeah. You know, I have, um, um, it's, it's, and you know, and what happens with these kids, Dr. Chester, is that in the absence of, you know, a family physician, you know, the emergency room gets to be their family doc, and the only time they get acute care is when they're really, really sick. And so, so we need to look after those elective things that need to be taken care of, you know, when, when a child is not actually really sick, but they might have problems that are yet to be diagnosed. And so what my hopes are for this book is that in some way, uh, the success of this book will help me fund, um, you know, su- supporting ministries like that that have been created and, and, and ministries that haven't. And so I, I, it's what I call abundance to be shared. Yes, yes. Oh, I love it. I love it. I, you know, it is just amazing, the, the heart of the people that I get to interview, and it is such a blessing to talk to each and every one of you, and I've never heard anyone address that issue of making sure that our kids don't fall through the cracks, because you're right. The ER, the urgent care does become their, their, main, their main source, and yes. it, you just need that extra step in that. That is amazing. Now, yes. we, we talk about two, three minutes left in the show, but I want to ask you some questions for those folks who may be an aspiring artist and they may be a little stuck. So my question mm-hmm. to you is, um, and there's no right or wrong answer, of course, just kind of picking your brain. Mm-hmm. Did you find that when you were writing, did you need a particular atmosphere or environment um, in order to write and be productive in your writing? Um, yes, I think, it's, I think it's helpful to find a place that's quiet, uh, a place that you can hopefully be free from interruptions, especially your, your cell phone that rings incessantly. Uh, and then yeah. you're able to, 
and that you that you you know when you and when you want to write a book, you don't have to have the whole the whole thing just doesn't magically float into your mind. You know, it, you, as long as you've got a really good idea about what you want to write about. Then you can begin, and over time, as you continue, it will just gradually take on a life of its own, and the, and the story will sort of unfold as you think about it. And I have to say that, that I feel like that this writing skill that I have, especially since it was something I never really thought much about, I feel that the, this gift I have is a gift from, from my creator, right? I just feel like That's I've right. got this gift he gave me, and I'm using it. So. People, you don't have to be any special person to be able to write a story. You just have to have an idea, and then you've got to have the faith in yourself that you can take that idea and take it to some logical conclusion. I, I love that. Now, do you think that as being a physician assistant, do you think that um, because you were so used to the study and having to uh, write and, you know, fill out all the paperwork on your patients. Do you think that that has helped you um, be a better author? Certainly, certainly it, it can. I mean, it, you know, it, I treated uh, my first decade in practice, uh, I was in practice with a, what we used to call a general practitioner back in the 1970s. Now they call them uh, uh, family practitioners. So so we had a great, we had a huge pediatric practice. So uh, being in practice with him, I got to treat a lot of children of all ages. And so when you treat lots of kids, you begin to see not just the kids that are your neighbor's kids or not just the kids you see on television programs, but you get to see kids that just come from every walk of life. And that's, I think, yeah. was a real benefit for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love it. I love it. Well, Lawrence, thank you so much for coming on and spending time with us today. I think that everyone has really enjoyed uh, spending time with you as well. And who doesn't love a really great kid book, you know? So thank you so much for coming on and telling us about your book. I want to ask you one last time before we go, however, if you could remind everyone, what is the title of your book, where can we get a copy, and how can we stay in contact with you? Oh, okay, so the title of the book is Evergreen. Uh, the, uh, the book is, uh, should be available at uh, Barnes & Noble and uh, um, Amazon, and you can also, I'm just getting ready to make it available on my website, and my website is pmcadventures.com. That's pmcadventures.com. I love it. Lawrence Quammen, thank you so much for being on the show again today. Thank you, Dr. Schefter. I'm proud to have the, have the opportunity to, be, to spend time with you. And listeners, thank you for spending time with us as well. We hope that we have inspired, enlightened, and empowered you. And as always, may the Lord continue to shine his face upon you. May you receive his grace and his mercy in all that you do. Until next time, everyone, remember that you are blessed in the Lord. Bye-bye.